welcome to State of the State. I'm John Calavalli, and um, this is the first production for the new year, 2024. And our guests are probably gentlemen that you've seen before, but just in case you haven't, I'll introduce immediately to my right, Richard August, member of the production crew. He interviews people. He is involved in uh, production uh, and a number of other things. He's a valuable member of the team. And the gentleman immediately next to him is, who can this be? <laughs> a famous baseball player? Yes, it is Mike Stenhouse. And Mike Stenhouse is a rather frequent guest, uh, at least over the years he has been. And from time to time, he actually interviews uh, other folks that uh, come uh, to uh, this desk uh, to talk about the things that are of interest to them. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, a couple of things. Um, we're going to take a look backwards uh, and then after we've done that, we're going to take a look forward uh, in terms of where we are now, a new year. And we're going to talk about some other matters relating to international concerns and so forth. So let's start with uh, a, a look back on the local level. A look back at the local uh, and state matters, uh, and uh, I'm going to ask this question of our two guests, and I will tell you in advance, they have a great deal of latitude about how they deal with these questions, and I may uh, join them in that latitude. Uh, when you look back, what do you consider to be one of the most important local, state, matters, events, concerns, and so forth of 2023. Can we start with you, Dick? Sure, I, I think um, undoubtedly I would look at the congressional race in the first district when Congressman Cicilline somewhat suddenly announced that he was not going to complete his term, so we had a special election, and we had a bevy of people that, on the Democrat side that wanted the nomination. And the leading person was the lieutenant governor. And then there was a dispute, or a, sorry, a scandal, I almost say, that one of her campaign workers was forging the documents, and mm -hmm. she kind of faded. And then all of, all of a sudden, this young man, Gabe Amo, with no other, and never having held an elective office, surges to the front and is now our congressman from that district. And, will be seeking re-election, obviously. And I think that was a, a pretty big story. And the other one was the Republicans did manage to field a candidate who was seemed to be a very good candidate, but there was, there was never a chance that he was gonna win in that district. It just, you know, it's just, this is a deep blue state, let's face it, and um, it, it's extremely difficult for a Republican to hold either a, congressional office or a state general office. I might add, Dick, that the Republican candidate was new to the political realm. This was the first time he had ever uh, sought a, a elective office. Uh, and uh, I think it just took him a little while to become comfortable because I saw him early and I saw him later and the improvement was really phenomenal. And I said, gee, this is really a good candidate. Well, you both, you and I both know that we attempted to get him to come on the program and his campaign was not well organized at all. I mean, we, we got bounced around between people who we didn't know if we were dealing with the person that arranges meetings or the, or the chief of staff or whatever. But, it, you know, what, and it's right, probably because he was a novice and, you know, the, the crew around him were also unfamiliar with, with how to run a campaign, but even so, even if he ran a stellar campaign, I don't think he was going to win in, a, in that strongly Democrat district. Indeed. I'd like to build on um, some, some things you both said there. Um, I'm going to focus on my disappointment. Some might be surprised to hear me say this. My disappointment 
with the Republican Party for a no number of reasons. Look, in this state, it's Democrat dominated. The Democrats are increasingly dominated by the progressive left, Marxist, socialist, woke, whatever you want to call them. And until uh, the opposition, the loyal opposition, which should be the Republican Party, realizes how to fight and stand up and not give in and not, and not go down the same losing path they've been going down uh, for decades, uh, nothing's going to change in this state. And things do need to change in this state. So first you had members of the Republican House leadership vote with the Democrat budget. You're supposed to, you don't vote for massive increases in spending and all the other regulations they put through. Where's the loyal opposition? Where's, where, where's the alternative? Uh, we had a candidate, like you talked about, who might have been a good guy, might have been a smart guy, but didn't do anything to, 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 to demonstrate that he was going to be different, didn't bring up any of the controversial issues like what they're teaching our kids in, in school and parental rights in, in his campaign and make a point of it. And then you had the party itself, where after all, a lot of talks, said, we're, hey, we're going to work hard, we're going to have... Um, we're going to have get out the vote and we're going to have mail ballot harvesting so we eliminate that Democrat advantage uh, that they have in those areas and nothing was done. So it, it's really, you know, I, you know, I'm, as a former athlete, I believe you have to fight and you got to fight hard. You got to, if they play dirty, you got to play dirty back. And we just don't seem to have a party that wants to do that. We have a bunch of people who just want to go along to get along. And I don't think we're ever going to see changes in our state with that attitude. So there you go. Uh, I would like to comment on something that uh, occurred <laughs> in your comments. Uh, there was tampering done with nomination papers. Mm. And you hear all the time, oh, no, that doesn't happen, yada, yada. It's not. And here we saw a perfectly good example uh, of it. And uh, I, I say we have to be aware that this stuff goes on and we have to look for it and call attention to it when we see it. Because in my, uh, from my perspective, it is really damaging the electoral process in this country. Now, it's not just uh, uh, something that happens in Rhode Island. It happens across this nation. Uh, and uh, that is a terrible thing from my perspective uh, because you hamper people when those things happen. And uh, you had indicated that this was going on without the knowledge of the candidate herself. Uh, that may or may not be true, but it can happen because someone thinks they're doing a good deed, but tampering with elections is not a good deed. Well, John, the first one who tampered in a significant way was our secretary, former Secretary of State, there's no provision in state law for her to say, I'm going to send out ballots to everybody. The legislature never enacted it. In fact, it's very specific about what has to happen on a mail-in ballot. And she just said, oh, well, because of COVID-19, we're going to do this. Right. And what happened, it was challenged in court, and the Democrat, who was the attorney general, Peter Narona, refused to represent the state, and the Supreme Court judge said, well, the state's not going to defend itself. We're not going to, I'm not going to rule. Yep. So all these mail ballots went out, and I think I told you or may have told the audience before. The, um, my son hasn't lived in Rhode Island since 1989. And he got two letters from the Board of Canvassers in town addressed to him. This is during the, the presidential election. I sent them back and I said, uh, he doesn't live here anymore. He hasn't lived here. What did I get in the mail? I got a mail ballot. I could have filled out that mail ballot and sent it in and if I wanted to forge a signature, which is, quote, against the law. But, you know, as you said, all the, does this stuff go on? Heck yes. And, and may I say, ditto. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what I mean by ditto? Because <laughs> what Dick August just described, I could have said the same thing because my son hasn't been living in my home for, <laughs> I don't know how many, yeah. it's, it's over a decade anyway. Sure. <laughs> and uh, I still get his mail from that office. I worked at polls that year uh, you know, for that election, 
And there was, we actually had a box in there for people who had, were walking in and bringing their mail-in ballot and putting a mail-in ballot in there. My question is, if you need a mail-in ballot and yet you're going to go to the polling place on election day, and why do you need a mail-in ballot to start with? Exactly. You know, the, how do I know that you're, you're putting in a mail-in ballot from you? Maybe it belongs to somebody else that, you know, that can't get there and they just filled it out for them. Well, Dick's, Dick's right. You know, the, the, <clears throat> that was the most important aspect of that special congressional election was, was the exposure of the vulnerabilities of, of the integrity, the signature. Uh, matching integrity of our whole mail ballot and election system. I mean, we, we complained during 2020 when Dick said when the, when the governor and secretary of state on their own without legislative approval and, and against the Constitution implemented new COVID related laws to weaken uh, ballot security. We, we said that, that we said there were vulnerabilities that fraud could happen. And guess what? Two years later in 2022, it happened yep. because those vulner and, and nobody's nobody's been held accountable. And nobody's talking about fixing any of the vulnerabilities. It's really something else. It's a huge frustration. Yes. yes it's a huge frustration. Well, uh, m may we move on to perhaps another topic? Sure. Um, uh, when, um, when you look back, what do you consider to be the most important aspect about the 2020, uh, 2023 special election for District 1? Now, you were just talking about that, but what was particularly special about that? Well, first of all, I think the fact that the incumbent suddenly decided he was going to move to the private nonprofit for a big boost in salary. Mm -hmm. And the fact that so many um, Democrats lined up to take his place um, and the, the way the whole thing played out and, and who was who was funding all these campaigns. Now, some of the campaigns were, um, you know, kind of weak to start with. But we had one candidate who was a firefighter in uh, Woonsocket. Yeah. And I thought, well, he's going to be strong because the firefighters will come out from. Well, he did win Woonsocket, yeah. the, the towns around there, but certainly not enough to overcome this, uh, I'm going to use the term, young upstart. <laughs> nobody ever heard of because he, he worked for the Biden administration and Raimondo and, and, and uh, Obama. And suddenly he's, he's now the congressman. Yeah. And, and you hit the nail right on the head from what I was thinking about. I don't think I've ever seen that many candidates seeking election to the same office. Not in my time, to the best of my recollection, yeah. that was a huge number of people. And then there's some people dropped out uh, for various reasons, illness and you know, the, uh, inability to raise money and so forth and, and so on. Mike, do you have a comment relative to that? Yeah, well, I think the vulnerability of the election process was the most important aspect. I would say the next important a aspect was the, the fact that this young upstart tried to position himself as a moderate guy. He sounded moderate. He speaks, he speaks and presents very well. But boy, when you looked at his website, and now we see some of his early votes in Congress, this guy is progressive left woke as they come. And he, I think he fooled uh, Democrat voters and voters across Rhode Island. Of course, there are many voters who prefer that in this state, sure. but he presented a very different image, consciously knowing that he was something very different. So Rhode Island voters, this is yet another woke progressive lefty. There's, there's no question about it. Let's talk about the amount of bills that we introduce <laughs> into the state and the the Speaker of the House actually commented on it. And it goes something like this. In his address to the House of Representatives during the opening 2024 session, Speaker Sirkachi asked legislators to limit the number of bills that they would be introducing during this session because the last session had an enormously large number of bills introduced. And I think it was somewhere around 
9,000 or more. Does that sound right to you, Dick? Well, I don't know if, yeah, it's pretty close. Yep, that's and, and so, I mean, is that a reasonable request for the speaker to make? And is that something that probably should become practice? We have a part-time legislature, six months, supposedly a six-month term. Um, and they, they don't meet all, all during that six months. They do have breaks and they do only are in session, I should say, three days a week, usually. And what happens is any constituent goes up to their representative or state senator and says, hey, I'm concerned about this. And the next thing, what do you get? Oh, I'll put a bill in for you. Yeah. And so a lot of this stuff is just, it's just nonsense. And uh, of course you have the, the, all the bills that have to relate to, which are more or less just passed you know, on, on a voice vote that it's, I want Mike to be the, the rep, rep, be this, uh, person who confers my marriage ceremony. So I want him to be a justice of the peace for the day. So they put a bill in for that. Those, those usually are just lumped together and they pass all at once. But what he's talking about is these, all these little bills that come up that are, they don't have enough support to start with, but yet important bills can't get enough co-sponsors. And I can, I can go through one specifically, but I'll let, my, let Mike get in. Thanks, Dick. I, I agree with you. It's, but it's the wrong approach the speaker has taken. People should be able to put in as many bills as they want. The question is, do you hold hearings on those bills or not? And that's what's decided by the Speaker of the House and the committee chairs and the Senate president and the committee chairs there as well. As Dick said, most of these bills are a bunch of baloney. Why waste taxpayer time? Why waste lawmaker time? Why waste the public's time and hold hearings on bills that nobody has any intention of moving forward? I quit, I used to testify all the time. I quit going to the state house. Yeah. You, you, you could go testify and you don't know which bills are important. I, I think having a hearing should signify, hey, this is a bill that's some legitimate interest in, in moving forward. And everything else, people can submit them, but you don't have to hold a hearing on them. It's a, you, I could, I've sat there four, five, six hours. I've sat there till 11 o'clock at night. One time I went to, got there at four o'clock, 11.30, the, the, the clerk came up and said, Mike, I don't think we're gonna get to your bill tonight. There's two more bills gonna be heard, then we're gonna call it, and now you might as well just go home. What a waste of time. Why would anybody waste their time going up there anymore when you don't know how long you're sitting there when they're, when they're having hearings on bills that nobody is going to move forward? So I think the speaker is shirking his responsibilities. He's trying to say, lawmakers, you limit the bills you put in. No, Mr. Speaker, you limit the bills that are gonna have hearings. That's what I think should happen. Or I could delegate that to the chairman. I mean, well, just make sure there's fewer hearings. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, you know, I would like to add this notion that if you don't have all this frivolous stuff taking up time, perhaps a great, greater amount of time might be devoted to looking at things that are very important because sometimes I think that bills get passed without adequate uh, discussion and, 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 and understanding on behalf of all the people that are going to be voting on. Well, see, you're exactly right, and that's the problem. Nobody knows which bills are on the fast track, which bills are favored by leadership, which bills are going to be automatically tabled for further study. So when there's 32 bills in an evening in the Health Economic Finance Committee, one of those bills might be really important, and it, but you don't know if it's going anywhere. So why would you go waste your time to testify? So there's got to be some process that, that, that starts triaging bills, if you would, right? That's what I think. We need, we need some method of triage before a hearing. I just, just want to add one thing about sure. testifying. Typically, if you go to a committee hearing and your state rep or your state senator is not on that committee, they don't care what you have to say. You're not going to vote for them or against them. And I, my, uh, I have a very good relationship with my state rep, and um, I've asked her, is, do they, what effect do they have, uh, oral testimony have on these committees? She said, what has, what has the most impact is a written, written testimony, believe it or not. She hmm. said, because they, they do put the, the secretaries, uh, clerks, whatever they call them for each committee, puts together a packet for all those bills. 
It's just typically legislators will sit there and look at the bill, and if there's written testimony, they'll at least scan it to see what the person has to say. And I've been to a number of, of hearings, and some of the people get up and repeat the same things over and over yep. again. And the chairman or chairwoman should simply say, if you agree with what a previous speaker has said, just get up and say, I agree with Mr. Stenhouse, and sit back down again. You don't have to repeat to hear yourself talk and be on you know, Capitol <laughs> TV. Just get it, get it over with. But a lot of these chair, chair people are reluctant to do that because they don't want to be seen as a, sure. quote, a bully or whatever. But what you said is of particular interest to me, Dick, because whenever I go to testify, I always give them a, a, a written copy of it. And I'm pleased to hear that they actually do something with that copy I gave Most them. Most of them do, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, you don't have to repeat the whole thing over. If you're given a written testimony, you can always say, I've submitted written testimony, just let me comment briefly. And, and be, brief, be brief, be yeah. brief. And some of them, and then you get the other side of this. You have the committee chairman who sit there with an egg timer and say, you've got three minutes. <laughs> You know, and, and unless you're unless you're a lobbyist or a union rep, you know that then that egg timer doesn't seem to work too well because they can go beyond. But if you know Joe Citizen goes up there, some of them say, "That's it, time's up." Well, I'm going to ask you. Uh, we're uh, still talking about part one, and we have consumed quite a bit of time. Shall we move on to another topical uh, area? Yes. In fairness to yeah, the other things that we'll talk about, and we can always come back. I'll make a note of where we left off. Uh, uh, the next thing that we would like to uh, take a look at uh, is uh, the business of looking forward to this new year that we started. And of course, this is an election year, both nationally and locally. Um, and so I'm going to ask, I'll start with Mike first good, and I think foremost. That's a good idea. Uh, Mike, is there a particular matter of concern that you have about the upcoming 2024 election or elections? Nationally. Nationally? For presidential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, I, I, don't, I, am, I am outraged at the interference uh, by whatever you want to call it, the Justice Department, the deep state, the Biden administration, um, on the, uh, the lawsuits uh, on, on the, the former president and, and, and whatnot. Uh, it's clearly a coordinated effort. It's clearly an attempt to interfere in the elections. We talked earlier about election integrity in our state. Uh, from a, from a ballot process, well, yep. this is this is far worse. This is this is this is banana republic, uh, totalitarian government kind of stuff, and uh, it's overt. It's out there. The media won't tell. Most of the media won't tell you about it, and um, and I, I think somebody's got to be held accountable for orchestrating all of this. I don't know exactly who it is, but it's got to begin with the Biden administration. Well, it had to begin and, somewhere. Yeah, and they're the ones who say, well, if you elect Donald Trump, it's an assault on democracy, but yet they're the ones assaulting democracy by trying to keep them off the ballot. So you figure that out. Yeah, it really concerns me that uh, uh, people want to restrict other people's right to seek elective office. And for the public to vote on And those for people. the public to vote, exactly. And um, I had a big case that went all the way to the United, the United States Supreme Court on Rhode Island election law. Uh, it's a very important thing to me, and it seems that uh, this is now occurring right before our eyes at the national level. Did well, I've, I'm going to raise the question that I have is, Will Joe Biden be the candidate? The reason I say that is that anybody who watches what's happening can see there's a definite cognitive decline in the man. Um, I, just before we went on the air, I was listening to a former White House physician who was President Obama's physician, who obviously was in contact, frequent contact with Vice President, then Vice President Biden. 
And he commented on the difference between that Joe Biden and the Joe Biden we see today. Um, well, that's a question that's open. And, and then the next question will be, well, if, if there, nobody's going to run against them, what can happen? People have to remember that in the Democratic Party, there are super delegates. Many. And, <laughs> yeah. And so what happens is in, the, in that uh, meeting, the super delegates can basically override the popular or the, the, the candidate that emerges from the primaries. And hmm. I don't think the party leaders are going to look at the, the dismal popularity ratings or performance ratings of the incumbent president and say, we're going to go with this guy. And their whole campaign is, is, gear, is obviously taking shape. It's gearing up um, against Donald John Trump. Now, what, what, is, what is the campaign based on? That there's three, uh, three themes. One is January 6th was an insurrection and, and Donald Trump was the instigator. The second is Roe v. Wade, the abortion mm -hmm. issue. We've got to make Roe v. Wade. We have to make ab abortion a national law. And the third is going to be the perennial thing they always drag out. We're going to protect Social Security. But this whole, as, as, this whole effort right now is aimed at identifying the former president, Donald Trump, as some re reincarnation of Adolf Hitler which is totally unfair, and they're using the Justice Department as the cudgel to try to keep this man so tied up in the legal uh, world and costing him a fortune to defend himself that they're hoping maybe he'll just fold up and say, I've had enough, which I don't think is in him. He won't do it. But um, they're, they're just beside themselves, and I don't think they're going to let Joe Biden be the candidate in the long run. So you're going to say, well, who are they going to run? <laughs> one of my, I heard one guy speculate, which doesn't surprise me, Michelle Obama and Gavin Newsom ticket. Well, wow. Comment, Mike? I don't see how Joe Biden can be the candidate, but I don't see how Joe Biden can't be the candidate. <laughs> no. Uh, I don't know what the Democrats will be. I don't think it'll be that ticket if it's somebody else. I don't know what's going to happen. I think they're between a rock and a hard place, the Democrat Party. Uh, their policies are so unpopular once people know about them. You look at the southern border, uh, which obviously Donald Trump's going to make an issue. Um, I don't know what they do. They, they do not have a good candidate, in my view, anywhere in this country at that level. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Uh, you know, you hear the claim that Donald Trump is a dictator, and he acknowledges that he is inclined to be a dictator. Uh, perhaps that's the way he ran and runs his business. But he was referring to his yeah, executive, yeah. So, so, but e let's, executive order authority. Let, let's that's assume a, that he gets elected and he's going to behave like a dictator. Who does that fall on? Congress is going to let him be a dictator? <laughs> it makes no sense to me. Well, that's what we have the courts for. And, and that's, that, he's not going to be a dictator. He, he's, he's followed the Constitution as well as anybody. Every president now take, tries to push the executive order envelope. Sure. Trump's been shot down a few times. Biden's been shot down many times. Obama got shot down many times. They're not trying to be dictators, none of them. They're just, they're just trying to test the limits of their executive uh, authority. And, of course. And Advanced the Supreme agenda. Court's going to have to uh, decide all these cases. Yeah, and, and, and if I were president, I'd probably do the same thing, because how else would you get the legislation passed that you want to get passed or the programs enacted that you want to, you have to push? Does that mean you're a dictator if you, you push? The president's job is not to pass legislation. Well, I, I, the, the, the president's the job is to enforce the laws that Congress <laughs> passes. Supreme Court's job is to interpret those laws to make sure they follow the Constitution. And increasingly in this country, we've, we've, we're, we're turning the corner. We're squeezing out the, uh, the, the legislative branch, aren't we? The, the, constitu the legislative branch is delegating more and more of its power to the fourth branch of government, which is the unelected bureaucracy. And the Supreme Court is being 
pushed not only the Supreme Court, but the federal judiciary, judiciary is being pushed into the point where you guys, you're not supposed to follow the Constitution. You're supposed to you know, interpret it in light of current social and cultural problems. That ain't what it's about. But nevertheless, that's what's happening. And I, I, you know, Trump, <clears throat> Donald Trump is, uh, is a unique personality. He's a political outsider, or, and even notwithstanding that he was elected president. But he is a, a very um, acerbic type of personality. And you got to look at his background. The guy was a successful real estate developer in New York City where he had to deal with the bureaucracy, with the labor unions, with organized crime, everybody that's involved in that construction business. And he was very successful at it. And he's, he wants to get things done and he makes, he asks hard questions. And what, sometimes when he does this, these Twitter and all these uh, social media posts, he gets carried away, and that's what bothers a lot of people. Yeah. They, you know, they don't like the, the way he handles some of this stuff. But that's, that's the way he handles it. Well, you know, it's an interesting thing, Dick, uh, that you bring up matters that have concerned me for a while. It, and, and I'll put it in this way. It seems that over the years, certain branches of government are no longer doing what they were enacted to do. And you hit the nail right on the head. Obviously, the president doesn't pass laws. It's passed by the, the Congress. <laughs> uh, and neither should the courts. It, it, exactly, right, right. exactly. Uh, we, we have a, a, a wonderful form of government where these uh, processes and these duties have been spelled out clearly, and I agree with you, Dick. They, they, they've been abused and violated, and it seems that it's, it's greater each year. The fourth branch of government is unique, John, because first of all, the people that are in it are not elected, and they're usually lifetime employees. And each regulatory agency writes the regulation, enforces the regulation, and adjudicates the punishment for violations. So the three, the three separations that are in the Constitution do not exist in the regulatory agencies. And Congress for years has done one thing. They, they can sit back and they go, well, this is a very complicated subject, so we're gonna delegate to the regulatory agency the mm. authority and power to do this. And you know what? When they step on somebody's toes, we can go, oh, it's a, we didn't do it. I'm, I'm right. your local congressman. That's right. Uh, you guys, you, you know, the regulatory people, those nasty people at EPA over there, they did it, right? Yep. And they, so, so it's like, it's a game. And in, if we don't change, this country is, is changing drastically. I think 2024 is a crucial year in our nation's history. I really believe that. If, if we continue to go drift the way we're going, and all you have to do is look at what's happening on the southern border. On day one, President Biden opened the floodgates, and yet to, the, to this very day, they keep saying, oh, the system's broken. <laughs> There is no authority for someone to walk across the border and say, I am declaring asylum because I don't like the economic conditions in my country. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad you've gone there because that is uh, a particularly important thing Excuse that me. has just eroded over the lifespan of the current president. And, uh, and now you hear him saying, well, it's, it's, it's not anything I've done. Oh, it's Congress. Congress has a, a broken system. We've got to amend the system. And people don't understand the difference between being a, a refugee, a political refugee, and being a, a person seeking asylum. Um, and I can go into that if you want, but uh, you can't just, in most, well, let's back up. You can't just come into most countries and say, I feel threatened in the country I'm in. There has to be a, a, a known reason. Mm -hmm. And political refugees typically are kept outside of the United States on the border until they're vetted. And I've heard, I heard a gentleman speak that went through this, an African gentleman. He got out of his country. He was a reporter, and he was under threat from the government of death. 
He was managed to escape to the neighboring country, was three years in a refugee camp, and he was being vetted the whole time, and until a Rhode Island sponsoring agency provided a sponsorship for him, he did not get here. Now he's, now he's in Rhode Island. And they had an apartment for him for a certain amount of time. They set him up. They said, you have to become self-sufficient within a year or two, because we're not going to just let you stay in the apartment. What do we do today? People come in and say, I want asylum. OK, we'll give you a cell phone. We'll give you, here's a debit card. Where do you want to go? Oh, you want to go up there? OK, you can get a hotel up there when you get there. And no. see you in 10 years. You're going to come back and, and plead your case in 10 years for asylum, if we can find you. Yeah, it's just horrible. Mike, you want to pick up on that? Well, the southern border, for national, all the reasons Dick said, um, is important, but we're, we're seeing the impact here in this state. We're essentially a sanctuary state. Providence is essentially a sanctuary city. You want to wonder why education is so poor in this state? It's because nobody will tell us how many illegal immigrants there are in our schools or on welfare or living in, quote, affordable housing. We have a housing crisis, not because we have a housing crisis. We have a housing crisis, so we have no place to put the illegal immigrants who are in this state. And they're, they're putting a strain on our social services, they're putting a strain on our educational system, they're putting a strain on our budget, and nobody will tell us how much, how many, or, or even acknowledge that it exists. The, the dishonesty uh, of this government, the disdain uh, these political supremacists have for the people and, and taxpayer money, is beyond comprehension, and uh, and I think nothing exemplifies that more than the false narratives and the lack of transparency when it comes to illegal immigration. Two of these topics together, the border and what the House Republicans are doing in terms of their stance about passing the budget. And they're saying, Let's fix the border. We can talk about those other things. Let's fix the border, and we can talk about those other things. Is that a proper position for the House Republicans to There's be taking? Lot in the U.S. Congress, yes. nationally. It, it's, all, it's, all a, it's all a political game. It's not proper for either one of them. The, the, you know, to Dick's earlier point, there are things the executive does have the authority to do right now to shut down probably 50, 75 percent of the illegal flow across the border. But yet Joe Biden, as, as Dick said, immediately undid all those safeguards mm -hmm. that were in place. Yep. So for the Democrats to claim that the immigration system is broken and I need more money to fix it, what they're saying is I need more money to process more illegal immigrants so I can pass them through and put them. Yep. He can stop the flow right now, largely, but he choose, chooses not to do it. For the Republicans to say, you know, we, can only, we, we only want to fo focus on the border first, I think that's the right thing from a practical point of view. But po politically, the Democrats are never going to agree to it. So it's like both sides don't want a solution. Mm -hmm. they, keep, they keep going down the same path that's going to get us nowhere. The only person that has the power to not play politics is the president. Trump took action to shut down the border, tried to build a wall. Biden took action to undo it. Either one of them then tries to blame co commerce. It's just political gamesmanship. I'd like to shift the topic to something of that's very, very important. Last week, our national debt exceeded $34 trillion yes, for the first time. Dick, thank you. The, the lar what's going to happen is the largest line item in the federal budget is going to be interest payments on that debt. This is a very serious issue that a lot of people aren't aware of or they're not interested in. Everybody knows what, what's happening to the price of everything, groceries, food, uh, gasoline, fuel oil, whatever you have. We all recognize it, but this is a very serious issue and this government cannot keep spending money like crazy. I agree. And, and for the House Republicans to say, we've got to become more fiscally responsible is great, but what's, what's going to happen over on the Senate side? Chuck Schumer is just putting anything the Republican House passes on the shelf and waiting to see what's going to happen. And if you know, the Republicans could lose, 
another seat or two in the Senate. That, that's bad enough. But in the House right now, there's only a two-vote Republican majority. Two votes. Yeah. That's it. And every seat in the House is up for re-election, as you know. Uh, and you, you don't have to worry about Seth Magaziner and Gabe Amo. They ain't going anywhere. They're going to be our Democrat, Republic, uh, Democrat representatives in Congress this next year, for the next two years. So um, I don't know uh, if people are going to wake up and understand what's happening. But this idea of modern monetary theory that we don't have to worry about this debt, we'll just keep spending because it's good, because the people will spend, ain't going to work. It's what it, causes the inflation. That's right. And it happens locally here as well with all the federal money and bond money we've been spending in this state. We have local inflation on top of the national inflation. And I agree with you, Dick, that it will undo this nation because there are other countries who have the money hold on us now. If and China what if said, they yeah, say, China, we're not rolling over the up. debt. Yeah, <laughs> we're not going to roll over the debt. I'm calling in the, the note. <laughs> it's just, just thinking about it. I'm, I'm beyond worry about it. It just makes me incessantly crazy because we keep spending and spending and spending. None, none of us can do that in our personal lives. Well, some people do, and they get themselves in trouble, and, uh, and then they, they use the bankruptcy law to, <laughs> to, to at least get out, get out of some of their, their responsibility. Uh, maybe that's what this, the government, the federal government's going to do. <laughs> well, that happens, John. People are going to, it's going to be an economic shock that's going to, be as bad or worse than the Great Depression. People ha have to start waking up. P people have to understand that the United States dollar is the world's reserve currency, which means that- Was. Well, get, we'll get to bricks and but <laughs> right now it still is. So nations can settle debts between themselves with the dollar as a basis. And the only reason that that happened is because after World War II, about 85% of the known physical gold in the world was in this country, Fort Knox and the Federal Reserve Banks. Mm -hmm. So it said, okay, well, we'll let the dollar be the, 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 you know, the fail safe because it's backed by, backed by gold. And I should be letting, Mike has a degree in economics, yeah, so, I let him talk about so this. Please but it was Mike. decided that at Bretton Woods, we had a meeting up there in New Hampshire, guess what? Uh, we, well, we'll do a little fool around. And so we went off the gold standard, and so now the government says, this is a Federal Reserve note. It's an IOU from the government, and that's all it is. And as long as we will accept it as a medium of exchange between individuals, between companies, between countries, that's fine. But do you realize that they're already talking about and moving toward a digital currency? Yes. <laughs> And do you know what that means? That means they'll know every move every we move make. Right. <laughs> and every, there won't any be any currency. Yep. There's not going to be any cash. It's all going to be controlled by uh, the government. Yeah. And, that's, and that's a scary thing because they will know everything that you have, what you own, and what you have purchased. And they can basically say, well, you know, there's some stuff we don't think people should be able to buy. How about let's start with guns? Mm. You cannot use digital currency. Well, the only thing I have is yeah, digital currency. How about currency. having your card blocked when you go to buy? Oh, yeah, right. right. Nope, sorry. Yeah. So anyway, um, this is a, it's a serious issue, and Indeed it is. somebody uh, better start waking up. We're going to talk about some uh, uh, international matters, uh, past and present, um, and let's start quickly with Ukraine. Um, and Dick, I know you have a multitude of uh, uh, ideas about the Ukraine situation. So please share some of it with us. John, we could spend the whole, we could have spent the half well, we, an hour, an hour on Ukraine. But, <laughs> we but let me just say that from the beginning, there was no hope that Ukraine was going to beat the Russians. This, for some reason, this administration led by the, I think she's the un deputy, or yeah, I think she's the deputy secretary of state, Victoria Nuland, who was terribly anti-Russian, anti-Putin. And we have violated, we, I should say NATO, 
is making overtures to have Ukraine join NATO, which was strictly forbidden in the basis of when Gorbachev said, okay, Ukraine, you can be a neutral nation, but you're the borderland. You've always been a buffer zone and we'll go along with this as long as you don't join NATO. And they've been pushing, pushing, pushing. And finally, Putin said, well, I better send a message because um, I'm gonna make it clear to them that we're not gonna allow this to happen. And the thing spiraled out of control primarily because the United States and they coerced Great Britain and Germany into se sending tons of material, say, okay, we're gonna fight the Russians. And in the beginning, the Russians, uh, I think were caught off guard, but now there's no way that Ukraine is gonna win back the, the eastern part of the country. Well, that is Russian speaking and it's always been a Russian speaking area. Yes. And, and this, is, this is going nowhere. And they've got, they've had, you can remember when this started, the whole thing was, well, Ukraine isn't taking many casualties. They're killing hundreds of thousands of Russians. Most people today agree that 600,000 Ukrainians have either been killed, and I'm talking about the military, killed, wounded in action, or are missing. Wow. And the Russians have, I mean, they don't have the population to support that to start with. You know, you so, know, so you, you see that um, the only solution is a negotiated solution? We ought to sit down and say, okay, we grant, we're not gonna force, force NATO in, or force Ukraine into NATO or, or try to get them in there. And maybe we can sit down and say, okay, the area that you have now controlled by force, you continue to control. You don't, con you don't have to control the whole country, but let's try to rebuild this country. And who are they gonna turn to to rebuild it? Like, oh, we got a lot of money to rebuild their country. Yeah. Mike? People wanna defy history. This is the way the world works. <laughs> Conquest. It's the way it's always worked. Um, so the, the idea that, oh, we can't allow Russia to take land through war, why not? That's the way the world has always worked. That's, we don't want it to happen that way, but, but let's not. accept the reality of it, right? That's the way we did it. Right, well, in a sense, yes. Um, also, there was no deterrent. And this goes back to the Obama years, when, 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 when Putin first made his move in Crimea and Obama did nothing about it. All he did was send blankets to the, to the Ukrainian troops. If we had armed the Ukrainian troops eight, 10 years ago, I doubt Russia would, would have attacked. Trump tried to up the ante a little bit, but it was too late. And then he was out of office. I don't think I don't think it would have happened if Trump was in office. So this is a great lesson, you know. And you got and you got to look at you know you, you got to look what's happened in Taiwan as well. Is there enough deterrent? Do we act soon enough to mm. deter China from making a similar move over there? I don't know. But anyway, this this it's a long. It's, I'm not a, I'm not a geopolitical expert, but uh, seems to me that, that the die was cast when when Obama refused to stand up to Putin. Very interesting, Mike. Well, you think we should uh, move on to Isra Is Israel and Gaza? As you know, we had a very good guest on for, we had two sessions with uh, uh, my, uh, Rick Snyzik, yes, who had just come back. And I had, in the second part, I asked him a couple of questions. Um, most people are not aware of what, what's really happening, but Baby Netanyahu, the prime minister, is under a lot of trouble, a lot of pressure. And I just heard today that Biden alluded to working behind the scenes to come up with some sort of a, quote, ceasefire. That's primarily because the, the Israeli Defense Force is made up largely of reservists. They have called up all the people that make the economy work. They are been, they're being fought to a, a stalemate in Gaza. Let's be honest, they've taken a lot of casualties. They've destroyed a, a large part of the country. Um, the ultimate goal of the Israeli government right now, uh, well, I should say the Netanyahu government, government, is to essentially force the Palestinians, almost all of them, out of Gaza into the Sinai Desert and create a basically a borderland there that, um, yeah, they'll leave a few of them in there, but it's basically gonna become a buffer zone. Egypt doesn't want them there. Um, and I think at some point, 
um, they're going to have to take face the fact that this is going nowhere, and they're going to have to sit down and make up some negotiation. Netanyahu doesn't really want to do that. I think what his ultimate goal is is to get the, draw the United States into a conflict to re react to an attack from the north oh, by Hezbollah, boy. and then ultimately to even perhaps goad an Iranian you know, American confrontation. And he'll stay empowered by doing that. Oh, that's depressing. <laughs> it is so depressing. <laughs> Mike? Again, reality. It's time for conquest. The idea of a two-state solution, as long as Hamas or Hezbollah or Iran have influence with the Palestinian people, the idea of a two-state solution is pointless. It's hopeless. It's never worked. It's never going to work. Let's give up on it. Let's have a one-state solution, Israel. Uh, they, they should conquest whatever they need to conquest and uh, keep control over whatever land they, uh, they acquire, and, um, like they did decades ago. You know, since it's been, what, 15 years um, since they let uh, Gaza self-govern itself, the people elected Hamas. I'm not saying they deserve the death, destruction that they're uh, experiencing right now after, the, after Hamas's brutal attacks, but as we hear all the time around here, elections have consequences, yep. and they elected terrorist group Hamas to be their government. It's time for conquest. And, and Mike, uh, you know, I, I, I have the sense that uh, uh, they're really not able to move those people out of the, 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 what is their country, so that, you know, I, I don't know if you- They don't have to move them. They'll be much more prosperous and safe longer living under Israeli government than they would be under Hamas government of their Indeed. own people. I agree with that. I, I absolutely believe that yeah. Israel governing that land will be better off for the people of that land. They don't have to move them. They just have to get rid of the terrorist elements. Mike, what do you do with 75% of the people, Gazans, Palestinians, whatever you want to call them, 75% of them support the attack on October 7th by Hamas. Right, but if they don't have the weapons and the money to do it again, what, so they complain. So what? And sticks Two and stones, solution. sticks and stones, yeah, right? Yeah. And names will never hurt me. Well, let's talk a little bit about Iran and uh, its role and what's going on there. And uh, our relationship with Iran has been failing since Shah of Iran was overthrown yeah. in the 1970s. That's it. <laughs> and the Mullahs took over, and they've been an adversary ever since. And so what, what happened is the Biden administration freed up $30 billion of frozen assets, and they were, they're using that to fund these groups. The Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, they're all, they're all funded by Iran. That, there's no really secret about that. And... Um, you know, they, they've kind of held he Hezbollah back, but Hezbollah has more advanced missiles and rockets than, than the um, Hamas. And they're better organized, they, they have a, they're a better fighting force. Israel, and I, I'm not disagreeing with what you said about the, the need for Israel, the two-state solution is not gonna work. Right. Hamas has, re and the Palestinian, Palestinian uh, PLO before them, rejected six times they right. rejected the, right. a two-state solution. But if you go, and I, as we talked to, to Rick Snizek, Hamas is not just a terrorist organization, it's an ideology. Indeed. Their mission is to eliminate the state of Israel and, and eliminate the, the Jewish population. Yep, from that and if reason. three yep. quarters of the people of an area hold that view, that is why the, the Israelis are saying, hey, I know we're killing these civilians, but that's what happens in, in this type of war. And these people, there was a, at least 500 civilians, if you want to call them that, who came across the border following the Hamas terrorist invasion and were participating in the, in the massacre that occurred. Hmm. And those, those people that were brought back, either alive or dead, were desecrated and, and the, the crowd was, a, you know, 
were, were uh, overjoyed at, at what they were doing. Well, how do, you, how do you sit down with a group of people and say, well, we're, we're going to coexist with you. Not easy. And, and you're going to be better off under us. Well, there's Palestinians in the West Bank. Yeah. Are, they, are they getting along? Well, if you listen to what Rick said about his trip, there were, you know, their life is, is okay. But you and I and Mike wouldn't want to live under those conditions that the Palestinians on the West Bank are under. Yeah, but do you want to live under Hamas's conditions? No. Okay. Of course not. There you go. Those, those are your two options. But the, but those are your two Palestine. options. <laughs> well, yeah. You don't have another option. Sorry. No. Yeah, it's just so terribly depressing for me that, uh, you know, uh, this has been going on who knows for how long. It's probably been going on for centuries, for, you know, yeah. and I'm not a great historian like you are. And it, it just frustrates me that we can't seem to just bring these people together and say, look, let, let's live in, in today, not in, you know, it's the, you know, 20 decades ago or 30 decades ago. It's just, it just frustrates me so much. But it's, it's, a, it's a different place in the world. I understand that. Uh, but, uh, and, and it would seem to me that that all those folks that live in that area would be much better off if they just stopped it all. <laughs> but I know that's a very simplistic yeah. view of, of it. If you just stop, Hamas comes back. Well, we uh, have just a short time remaining. So perhaps uh, we could say if there's anything else that you'd like to comment in the next couple of minutes, uh, let's do that because my timer is going to go off soon and we'll probably have a couple of minutes remaining after that. So Mike, do you want to go? Yeah, I want to explain why I'm wearing this H hat today. This, uh, from my alma mater to Harvard University. I used to wear it with pride, being an economics major there and an all-American mm -hmm. baseball player there. But now I wear it as a symbol of protest. Mm -hmm. uh, we all know what happened with the former president, Claudine Gay. I wrote a column that's on OceanStateCurrent.com basically equating the head of Harvard University, that educational institution, with the head of Rhode Island's educational uh, department, Angelica Infante Green. And, and, I, and I go through a whole litany of things. They're really not any different. They're both products of the diversity, equity, inclusion uh, system. They both got their jobs that they had no qualifications for. They both ruined the educational systems they were in charge of. And, and they both have stifled free speech from those who don't go with the narrative. And the list goes on and on and on. So what you see with Claudine Gay at Harvard and all her problems and all her biases and why she should be out are the same things you see with Angelica Infante Green in Rhode Island, same problems, and why we are calling for her resignation wow. from Ride. So my little thought was, is that the Department of Defense budget is approaching $1 trillion. The defense in, uh, and industry, if you'll call it that, the military industrial complex, the backlog currently stands at $778 million. Oh my word. These are orders that they have, that they can't produce because they don't have the, you know, um, can't produce quickly as, as we did in World War II because they don't have the capacity to just crank this stuff out. And we've got to replace for our own forces the material that we've sent to Ukraine and are sending to Israel. Um, th there's a basic question that I think has to be answered. Do we need between 700 and 800 bases around the world? Do we need to have 27,000 American servicemen and women in Korea when the war ended in for all intents and purposes in 1953? And South Korea is now a prosperous economy with their own Defense Force. Why are, why are we all around the world doing this? A lot of this stuff has been a holdover from World War II, and we're still there. And this budget is, is approaching $1 trillion. Gentlemen, we're just about at the end of our time. Uh, I want to thank both of you immensely for uh, sharing a perspective that uh, our viewers can Ponder, think about. Right. They don't have to agree with it because that's, right. that's not what state of the state is about. We don't ask the viewers to 
agree with everything that's said by whomever on this program, but to think about it. And I want to thank you folks for watching, and please join us again.